Já estamos online. Boa noite e sejam bem-vindos e bem-vindas a mais um Clown Talks. Hoje vai falar totalmente em inglês. Eu estou aqui com a escaladora de alto rendimento, Stasha Gale. Espero que tenha falado o nome dela direito. E a gente vai falar sobre várias coisas de escalada, que é como que é escalar na Sérvia, como que é se preparar para a Copa do Mundo e outras coisas. Então, a partir de agora, a gente vai começar a falar em inglês. Stasha Thank you very much for accepting my invitation for, for this interview. And please, present yourself to the public. Who is Stasha Gale? Uh, hi, Luciana. Thanks for inviting me. It's a big pleasure to, to be a, a guest in this interview. So I'm Stasha Gale. I'm from Serbia. I'm 23 years old. Um, and I'm an elite uh, sport climber. Um, I'm mostly a boulder, but I also enjoy climbing outside. Uh, on rope and bouldering equally. I won quite some medals on the World Championships and European Championships um, and the World Cups. So, yeah, I'm a climber and I'm also an electrical engineer. Oh, that's cool. Well, first of all, why a person from Brazil should visit and know about and make some kind of backpack on Serbia? Because we, we have to study more to know about the the countries on the east side on on Europe. So what it's interesting for the someone here from Brazil visit Serbia. Well, I think advice? Latino culture, yeah, Latino culture and Balkan culture are very very different. The complete opposite, I would say. But we have some things in common and I think we're both Cultures are very loud people, which is super interesting. Um, I have some friends at the university uh, who are Brazilian, and some of them visited uh, the Balkans, Serbia and Macedonia, and they really, really enjoyed it. So Serbia is really interesting. It's not as, um, hmm, let's say, technologically and um, opinion-wise, it's not as developed as European Union countries. But it's still very, we're very good hosts. We have really good food, amazing music, and we're very good hosts in, in the sense that we like having uh, guests over. We like to show all our tradition to our guests. Uh, we're Orthodox Christian, mostly in Serbia. Um, and this traditional um, religious uh, holidays are very, um, hmm, how to say, very important in, in, in Serbia. And um, a lot of our our uh, traditions are turning around the religious beliefs and religious holidays. Um, so it's a very interesting experience for, for foreigners that come to Serbia. Um, and our diet is mostly meat, a lot of grilled meat, um, definitely a lot of bread and uh, Yeah, it's the music is uh, the folk music is very interesting one, very lively. We have also uh, a dance that is uh, following the music, uh, where people like make a row like a queue and they hold hands and then there are different steps and different rhythms. So uh, Serbia's capital is Belgrade, and it's a very beautiful city. I come from Niš, it's uh, southeast from Belgrade around two, two and a half hours to drive. Um, and yeah, it's a very, very special and very dear to me country with beautiful nature. You have everything, mountains, you have uh, flat areas with a lot of agriculture, um, different natural uh, miracles around Serbia. So it's very worth visiting. Uh, that's nice. And I... I can imagine you have a, I don't know, a strictly diet because we are, we will talk about it this later. But what is you suggest for the typical dishes from Serbia? What's the main dishes you suggest for someone taste it if visit Serbia? Mm -hmm. Well, my definitely my favorite one is pasul. It's like a bean soup. Um, it's a very very traditional meal. And uh, it's my favorite because you can make it also without meat. I, I don't eat meat. And that is why my, my diet is not very consistent with the Serbian traditional <laughs> diet. But there are some meals that you can make them also without meat. So pasta mm -hmm. is definitely my favorite one. Um, then there's sarma, which is a minced meat with uh, rice, 
like a mixture of that, mm-hmm. rolled in uh, grape uh, herb leaves or in cabbage leaves. Um, these two are definitely my biggest recommendation. Then you have different grill specialties. Piascarica is like a hamburger, but it's made in a different way than a regular hamburger. Um, yeah, grill is grill is somehow the pride of Serbia, although I'm not a very big fan of grill. Mostly like these cooked meals. Meals in Serbia are usually slow cooked, so they take a long day. Women would used to get up early, uh, like five or six before they go to the field, and then like start cooking so the lunch could be ready uh, by the lunchtime. Yes, I'm seeing the pictures here. It's almost meat <laughs> all the time. Yeah, it's meat and a lot of fat. It's very fatty, and I also don't like that. But sometimes, you know, once in a while when I go home, I treat myself with some good meal. Yes. Well, you are more than invited to visit Brazil because we have a, several salads all year, all around the year, mm-hmm. uh, several fruits. So if you want interesting to, I don't know, be your preparation for the World Cup here in Brazil, you are more than yeah. invited. I planned, I've never been to uh, South America, and that was my plan for some years now. Um, when I have more time to travel around, I plan to go with my sister and make like a South American tour, and obviously meet, uh, go see Brazil. It's definitely on the list. You are, you, are uh, you told me you are 22 years old, 23 years old. 23, yeah. You have the whole time of the world. Yes, exactly. Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. So uh, the next question I was talking about the South America and what the news about the interesting scenes about the climbing, you know it or the people talk there on Europe or in Serbia on South America and Brazil. They talk about the climbing on Patagonia, on Rio here in Brazil or yeah. what What the, the news about the climbing scene here in Brazil? Well, I know just a few people from Brazil that uh, climbed, and uh, my dad was in Rio, and he climbed uh, on the Sugarhead. Is that what it's called? Sugarloaf. Yes. Yeah, Sugarloaf. Yeah, yeah, he was there. He was telling me how impressed he was with people who would climb it, and it looks like there's no holes at all on there. Um, so I hear a lot about Rio and climbing around there. Um, But yeah, Patagonia is super popular, but more like alpinistic. But in rock climbing, uh, Sugarloaf is definitely the most popular in Europe. Yes. Well, you have to start climbing at seven o'clock of morning or earlier to avoid the heat because that some mm-hmm. some hour the sun is it's, it's cruel, but it's the sun yeah. there is. Yeah for 10 times the, on every place on the world. So. Yeah, 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 I totally understand. It's so funny, one a friend of mine that's from university, he's Brazilian, and he's always complaining how us Europeans are spoiled that we always want to climb in the cold weather, and in Brazil there's not such a thing as cold weather. They always climb, you know, it's hot, and uh, that's what it is. So uh, I guess he's very used to very, very hot climbing days in Europe we don't really do that <laughs> <laughs> I understand so tell us when you start to climbing and why you are just I don't know fooling around or something and oh, I will start to climbing how was the, the start on this sport for you well actually I started in my family so I didn't just come up to climbing and randomly met it somewhere so my parents are climbers and they brought me everywhere with them i was playing with equipment when i was a kid that was during my toys quick draws and ropes so i did try other sports when i was growing up like i tried i played a lot of football i did a lot of track and field um, and running but i always stayed in football in, sorry not in football in climbing um because we also have a house in the climbing area Uh, in Serbia, so uh, I had like five minutes walk to the second biggest climbing area in, in Serbia. So yeah, this was my life from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Uh, how is the infrastructure for for I don't know the climbing scene there on Serbia? Because 
there's a kind of legend here in Brazil because Europe has the better infrastructure with the gyms, with uh, several competitions, and because of that, the athletes, it's better than here on South America. But I just want to know, you are a very strong climber, and you probably training there on Serbia on the local infrastructure. How was the infrastructure for climbing and training on Serbia, comparing with the other well, centers? Um, well, Europe is well known for good infrastructure, obviously, but this is because um, the countries of West Europe have a lot of funding and uh, their climbing is a lot more popular, so they could uh, afford to build a lot of climbing centers, and they still do. In Serbia, that's not the case. Uh, first of all, the country itself is not that rich, and uh, I think it's kind of similar to Brazil, to be honest. There is there mm -hmm. are climbing centers, but it's not like in other countries. Like you go 300 kilometers to the north, and it's a completely different world. Um, luckily, in the last couple of years, climbing has really uh, developed a lot. Um, I am proud to have brought more people to climbing uh, with my success in competitions. So we built an Olympic training center basically two or three years ago, and uh, now it's fully open, and it has everything, a bowling wall, a big massive league wall, and a speed wall as well. And I'm really proud that we managed to build such a thing because if we could talk like 10 years before, it was not possible to build anything similar. There were just some small boulder gyms somewhere in some basements where people could find, find cheap places to rent. Um, so yeah, now, now it's getting some growth, obviously, but it's not like Austria, Germany, not even close. Mm. But that's why, that's why I moved to Europe um, to trade and to study. I lived in Slovenia for five years when I was from, like when I was 16, I moved out of Serbia for some better training uh, circumstances and now I'm in Germany since two years ago. You very, it's funny because you, you say, ah, I was on Slovenia and moved to Serbia. It's like for, oh, it's another country. But for here in Brazil, the distance, it's about how, no, it's how far is it? <laughs> but from my hometown to where I live in Slovenia was maybe seven or eight hours drive. And now to Munich, Munich is around 12, 11 or 12 hours drive to my hometown. Yes, so. this is, yeah. yes. It's Europe is small. Europe is a very small country, yeah. <laughs> I yes. kind of like it for that. Yes, I love it also. Well, uh, and for your training uh, routine, how was your training routine? Who built your spreadsheet for, I don't know, several push-ups, several pull-ups, or everything else. And how was the planning for for the each each one of the World Cup? Well, until I moved out of my home, I did everything with my parents only. And my mom and dad, my coaches, um, like full-time coaches. So they were scheduling everything, planning, teaching me technique, uh, taking me outdoors to climb on rocks. Um, but at some point, we there was not much more they could teach me when I was around 15. So I began to struggle because I needed to learn more, but there was it was hard to learn in Serbia. So for that reason, we, we did travel a lot. We went to Austria every winter for... At least a one, uh, at least a week for trainings. We went to Bulgaria all the time, so we tried to do it ourselves as much as possible. But then, at the age of 15, it was kind of a limit where we needed a bigger change. So that's why I moved to Slovenia to work with uh, their coaches and their national team, so that I can become better. And it worked. It was a really big change, and it was really beneficial for me. But every now and then, you know, yeah, you hit a plateau, and then it's harder for me to uh, to do um, progress, so I need somebody else to be included. It, still now, I do my plans together with my parents, and they're 
basically the visual critics of my climbing. They can see every every time that when I when I lack some skill, when I lack mobility, when I lack power, they can see every element that's lacking. So then we together work and adapt uh, the training so I can um, get them uh, those weak points stronger. So yeah, that's that's how it worked. Then I still go to competitions with my parents together. Uh, she's really funny, but really cool as well. Uh, Understood. Well, there's times on our life we are, I don't know, we, we, we felt we are cursed. And I can imagine for you because you felt cursed on the, I don't know, last years because you get some kind of injury on your knee. And right after yeah. that, uh, it is a pandemic with the COVID. With, we are two years Look for you. You are, your country probably is doing something right because we are trying to do everything wrong here, and and now we are getting more. I don't know the new normal. Let's call it that, the new normal. Yeah. How, what is the, your your advice for someone? It, it is living on the personal hell like you did because you get yours. You was very strong, get injured, get out of injury. And after that uh, pandemic and I have to do inside the house and have to adapt your training for a reality no one knows. Well, I wouldn't personally call it a personal hell. It, it was not hell, really. It, it, there's always a good thing in every bad situation. When I got injured, I could work on a lot of my upper body strengths Uh, when there was pandemic, I could fly outside a lot and meet some new people and experience a bit of a different life outside of competitions, which I really liked. And it was hard to get back to competition after such a relaxed time, let's say. But I, I learned a lot in these couple of years that were crazy. Um, it was quite the opposite. Um, maybe the moment of injury was a hell and it was really hard to try to qualify for Tokyo with only one opportunity and then still being second. That was really painful. But there's always lessons to learn. So you always try to get the best out of the situation and the best of what you can do with your body and your mind at the moment. Um, so I think every situation can be over overcome and uh, we can always be better. Understood. Well, let's talk about the elephant on the room. Uh, today, on the cover of the Disney Vell, uh, you are telling about your eating disorder and how you was drove it to it and what you are doing for handling. What kind? And personally, I got also when I was training for. I don't know, climbing some kind of routes, rise the my 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 routes, rise my degree of I was climbing and I was yeah. get some kind of eating disorder also. I start to almost be a bulimic or something like that, I have to get some kind of psychological help yeah. with a nutritionist, with a psychologist and everything else. So for the whole community, it, now it's talking about the eating disorder. In your opinion, what's, what's your opinion about uh, how we can talk this more, more openly? Well, as you, you did I think, I think um, well, I always try to say that my eating disorder was not that that harsh, let's say. I was on the mild side of it because we caught it on time. I had people around me that could help me with it. Um, it wasn't that bad because I know a lot of people who were even clinical cases um, of eating disorder. I had different phases. So it began with just not eating enough. And I really liked how light I was. I really liked how I just, lost weight super quickly I was hungry all the time and then at some point you don't even realize how bad it is for you because you climb 
a lot better than you do. But the thing is, you're not really strong. You're just very light. It's like you trained with a weight vest of 10 kilos the whole time for years, and then suddenly you drop the 10 kilos down. And that's technically what happens when you lose the weight. But you disrupt all of your hormones in your body. You disrupt the normal functioning of the mind, your emotions, basically everything. And uh, in climbing, it's really hard to get out of it because you really like how you look and you like how you climb. And you try to not look at the bad side of what you're doing. So unless you have a good medical support, it's really hard to, or slash almost impossible to get out of it. So I was just trying to bring more attention to this because it seemed that the climbing community kind of neglected this topic and talked about random other things that are way less important than this. And inside the climbing scene on the World Cups, this was the most discussed topic the whole year, this 2021. We talked about this all the time with all my friends, competitors, coaches, judges. Everybody talks about this because we don't have good rules to fight this. Mm -hmm. So I thought, let's, let's share a very light story that basically everybody has some experience with and see what happens. And yeah, a lot of people reacted positively to my posts, which I really didn't expect so much reaction. Um, I feel like now I'm center of attention of this, but um, I really believe we just need a movement that will help bring some good rules to how to fight it and good education for young people. Cool. Well, you are one of the most beloved climbers on, on the EFFC scene because you are really authentic. <laughs> and I, I want to know also on the end of this interview, I want to, to learn some some cursed words on 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 Serbian just for no. identify. Uh, yes, I just want to identify what kind of reaction because I love it on the last last time you 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 was you was cursing all the time and everyone was well probably she was oh, no. talking you know, with the with the hold. And I try not to curse. I really try not to curse. I mostly argue with myself, but okay. <laughs> yeah, strongly. <laughs> but I can see it was strongly. And your father also. It's uh, one of the beloved characters on there. And he is giving you instructions all the time and give you some kind of, I don't know the name of English, but he's pushing you more 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 ahead so how, how was for you get your father get so involved on on your career and on your competition well yeah that that is a great support and that is a big critic that is somebody i don't want to disappoint <laughs> um, <laughs> that's one of the bad things about having your parents as your coaches is because you know it gets personal really quickly you know <laughs> um <laughs> But he's great, and I really like when both of them are present at the competitions, both mom and dad, because then it's a nice balance. If it's just me and dad, it gets tough. Um, because we're similar characters, we're both very stubborn. We like to argue a lot with each other for no reason, obviously, just proving who's right for whatever <laughs> reason. Um, but yeah, he cheers a lot for me. It's not like he gives me instructions. You're not allowed to do that. Um, on the competitions, it's strictly forbidden. So he's just cheering for me a lot. Uh, and he's, by his tone of his voice, I, I just start pushing harder. It's like, I don't want to disappoint him <laughs> in a way. It's just super funny, but also not that good in a way. But yeah, he was there from the very beginning. He was the one who brought me to climbing. He was the one who paid and drove me around Europe to be able to climb with the good competition, to see different gyms around our areas. And he did basically everything for me. And really, if you don't, if you, if you don't have a parent like that, um, it's really hard to get to this point, you know? So we're still here and because we still function really well and we're very efficient and 
um, we have split tasks in on as a national team. It's like me, my mom, and my dad. That's the three member national team of Serbia, and they're very passionate, as you can see here. My mom is going wild, and the, their emotions. I can hear them. I can feel them from the audience, and that it gives me some extra boost every time. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible, nice. Uh, here, I don't know there on on Serbia, but here in Brazil, every end of the year, ever New Year's, we are several. We have several rituals. We, I don't know, light candles. We throw roses on the sea. We jump seven waves and get back with back walking. We uh, jump to underwater we have several things several things just for make uh new years and now the season for for competition is over so what's your plans for the next year make this kind of rituals and and what kind of goals you will assign for yourself also well next year is going to be very interesting because um in 2021 i didn't do any lead competitions I focused only on bouldering because I didn't qualify for Olympic Games, so I thought I would use this year to do what I really, really like and what I'm best at, and that's bouldering. And I also used this year to go to Rocklands for the first time to South Africa and climb on the boats there. Um, in my free time, I really like to spend uh, my climbing days outside. Now I'm in Fontainebleau. And on the beginning of my trip, I just arrived today, so I'm going to spend a week and a half here and climb. So next year is going to be very serious with competitions. I'm doing both lead and bouldering. I'm preparing actively for qualifications for Paris Olympics. This is the main focus for the next uh, three years. And uh, all my life revolves around the Olympic Games in Paris. So I'm just going to do everything I can to be ready to qualify as soon as possible uh, for the Olympic Games and uh, to be very prepared for the Olympic Games. Cool. Well, let's talk now about shenanigans because I'm very curious and no one, no one answer me. First question. Uh, let me put your unmaging of yours, climbing. Yes. First question. Uh, why all the climbers has some kind of shirt or, or t-shirt without without sleeves? Why? Oh, it's a very sexist thing. I think I think females are supposed to wear no sleeve. Uh, no, no, men also shirts. don't I use don't sleeves. Men of, I don't know. I I guess that's a more cool design. National federations give you these. Uh, you see more muscle, I assume. I don't know. I don't like them really. I like normal t-shirts more, to be honest, but it doesn't look as cool, you know. It's like this weird body exposure that you have. I don't know. Yeah. Because US... normal t-shirts look like a sleeping t-shirt, you know. Yes. US uh, uh, athlete with the, your your national team there, you don't, the team don't discuss about the the uniform design or something like that? Yeah, we do actually, we do. We, we find a suitable design. Uh, like this year, we worked with my sponsor and we decided which colors, which models. I mean, it's it's just a traditional thing. It's what everybody does, you know. It's It really looks cooler, you know, when you climb. I did climb last year on the European Championships. I climbed in uh, short sleeves and it doesn't look cool in pictures, really. Mm. Mm. People want to see the biceps. You want we need to show the biceps and the back. And it looks nice, really. It's I think it's just that. So I covering the competitions with uh, I don't know <laughs> 10 years. I have a really, really good question. I noticed when the girls is com is on a competition, probably on Boulder more, some someone knows do braids. And mm. and there's some kind of I don't know championships. All the girls using braids. This is 
Why? It's Who ridiculous. Does this it's ridiculous. I don't know. It's like the team, they, they do it for each other. They think it's very cute and they all have these, I don't know, different uh, rubber bands with, uh, what are they called? Butterflies or whatever, ornaments in their hair, scarves or whatever. I mean, I'm not a fan of this. I, I like my ponytail. If I if my mom allowed me, I'd cut my hair short, but my mom freaks out when I mention that. So that's why I keep my hair long. Like last year I shaved like I had a side cut and it's still yes. growing. My mom was excited at the beginning, but then she wasn't anymore. So it's grown a bit. Wait, where is it? So this is my hair now. <laughs> it's very uneven and uh, very funny here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I don't know. I think uh, in climbing, most of the girls like to be very girly and princess-like. I don't know, not my thing, to be honest. So you have a a hair with ponytail. So what's you, you have some kind of ritual for your 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 vein stuff, your your nails, your hair, or no. whatever it is it? Nothing. I have no rituals. I paint my nails when I feel like it. Sometimes I paint them black. Sometimes I paint them red. Mostly I don't paint them. My hair is always the same. It just has to be fixed and not bother me. Um, no. Really, I, no, not many. Like with my appearance, I don't put makeup on. I have no rituals. Really. Yes, I just asking because several girls I know it don't w wash the hair the day before to be more I don't know stick on the head and go. Uh, a lot on 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 podiatrist for don't be, for be more comfortable with the with the climb shoes and don't use to go to the manicure also because it was waste of money because of that I, I mean, yeah I don't, because, I don't do pedicures yes it's no. because girls has a huge universe for our for us mm. men girls has a huge universe we are no, don't, we don't know okay. nothing. Interesting. About. Okay. We don't know yeah. nothing about. I'm not. I'm not that interested in that universe either. It's it's a waste of time and money, and it's for climbing. It's used. I think I always use every opportunity to dress nicely when I'm going to the city just to do some business stuff, whatever. And people always get shocked, like, "Oh, why are you so well dressed?" Like, because I always look like a dirt bag. So. I want to look nice every now and then, and I use every opportunity for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and probably you you are seeing your your you already graduated on on electrical engineer. You told me. Yeah, I did the bachelor's. Now I study masters in Munich. <laughs> yes, how was for you? I don't know. Uh, manage study for something really hard because I am also a civil engineer. I have mm -hmm. two masters, but I have civil engineer and managed a hard course like electric engineer and training for competition on climbing. Well, it's it's hard. I mean, I did this combinations my whole life. Like I did, I went to music school also when I was a kid, so I had two schools and climbing full time. And then the more I climbed, I had to kick out activities. So essentially, music school also got kicked out when I moved to Slovenia. But studying is—it's just how important it is to me to finish it on time and to finish it well and to actually be good at engineering is what pushed me to do it well simultaneously with climbing um it's just like personal hygiene it's just my kind of brain activity i need it it's essential if i don't do it it's very wrong for it's bad for me so this kind of necessity pushed me to be very organized and to plan my timing very well when i had exams it was hard um because i would sleep less but i would still train as much as i could just to so I can do the exams well and not stop climbing. Because many people I know, they stop climbing completely. They don't train at all for a month because they have exams. I can't allow that to myself. So I always did both. Now it's 
it's it's been hard in the last year of Masters, really, especially mm-hmm. after COVID when all the competitions came back. It was slightly chaotic, but um, now I got used to it, and now the new semester starts. I don't have many things to do, so it's going all right. But yeah, it's a necessity. Yeah, you told me you study music. What kind of instrument you play? Uh, viola. I started when I was 10 years, I started with the violin, but then three years later, I switched to viola. It's uh, a bigger version of violin, a mm-hmm. bit deeper, but darker. It's very nice. Yes, because <laughs> violin was not uh, hard enough. So let's change to viola. Well, it, it was too small. It was too small. And uh, I grew a lot, and my fingers got very big. So I couldn't really play the violin anymore. Viola was more like my character and my body size. <laughs> It's very nice. Stasa Gayo, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you for open uh, a time on your schedule because I know <laughs> I have to It's very tra- nice. training a lot and everything else. And do you have any message for, for here in Brazil, for visit uh, Serbia, for receiving or hosting for you here on on brazil for training on on hot weather with salad we have salad <laughs> and fruits oh, and good. everything I like salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you're always welcome to serbia it would be a very unique experience something you never dreamed of um i highly recommend it uh, for everybody not just brazilians um and yeah uh, maybe host me in six years or something <laughs> <laughs> cool Stasha again thank you very much see you soon hopefully on, on the competition on, on the World Cup and you are more than welcome to come here to Brazil thank you very much yes, thank you very much Luciano thanks <laughs>